So uh, tonight's speaker is uh, Casey Wiss coming from uh, LA and uh, for me his work is uh, incredibly important because uh, and, and it's making, I would say it's making a huge impact for years now uh, in architectural uh, culture. Although Casey is coming from a kind of visual cultures and I guess we were studying at the same time uh, maybe 99, 2000, I was at Columbia studying architecture and Casey was uh, at MIT uh, studying visual arts. And at that time, I remember we were using lots of off-the-shelf software. So for some of you that are more engaged in computation, digital tools, things like Maya, SoftMash, all this software, but everything was kind of a black, black box. And we were just able to uh, use these uh, redefined tools that were developed for movie industry and, and somehow reproduce the effects that already existed. So the imagination was, uh, I would say, uh, somewhat restricted for, for people in architecture. So we started, there was a small group, especially my colleagues, and we started to actually engage with code directly. So instead of just using tools, uh, uh, there was a, a in, in engagement into scripting and, and, and code. And, and that was also very hard because lots of platforms like Maya or Z at the time were very closed again and were not allowing us to easily develop uh, this kind of um, uh, basically a more open source uh, exercise. And then somehow a couple of years uh, after we just started this effort, uh, suddenly there was this new platform called Processing, which uh, uh, case developed with uh, Ben Fry, and I think it was released in 2001. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe around 2002, 2003, it came into architecture, and it was a fantastic, and still is to this day. Today, we just had a beginning with a new generation of uh, uh, students that just came into school. First workshops, already at least three, three workshops are running of processing. So it's a really fantastic platform, and it also this idea of uh, uh, sharing or open source kind of collective uh, uh, creation, it, it kind of also uh, develops completely different way of thinking about design and, and uh, this idea of uh, having the access to underlying code, of the, uh, DNA of, of uh, um, structure or, or, or form, that when you change something at the bottom level, it trickles uh, throughout. Um, so, anyways, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you are using uh, processing at the moment. I would just say that uh, Casey Rees, his work is very well known internationally. It was exhibited in, in every major museum, I guess, uh, worldwide. Uh, I won't go through the long list of, of uh, institutions. He's also uh, teaching uh, at uh, UCLA, so in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, one thing about Casey, it's not only that he's developing this kind of very generously investing his time and then giving away this kind of uh, um, software that, that then creates the whole community of, of people working with the generative design. But I would say as a designer, there is a kind of, uh, it's a rare case of someone who really spends time in this kind of design search, and you will see that I'm sure tonight, with a kind of sophistication of colors, of behaviors, so it's really something that is uh, uh, quite rare because lots of people working with generative code uh, um, uh, just expect that code will do magic and everything. And, and, and there are very few designers still that really immerse into this kind of design search territory. So with a great, great pleasure, I introduce uh, Casey Lees. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see you this evening. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, it's my first lecture of the fall, so I have a lot of energy today. Um, also, I know that you're just starting this week, and we're starting our quarter at UCLA on Monday, so there's a lot of, a lot of new energy. Um, in the talk today, I have it divided into six different sections. And at the beginning, I'm going to talk mostly about my own work and my most recent work. I spent all summer in the studio, so I have a lot of new work to show. And then over time, we're going to talk about one system in a lot of detail, like really looking at the most minimal system that I've been able to, to work with and, and looking at how the system itself and the way it's visualized are um, coupled together. And then I'm going to take things much further up and talk about, try and bring it back around to architecture and show some examples. Sorry, I'm just trying to find lights. Oh, lights. I think it's on this. 
console. Turn that back to white and then you could. Uh, it's fine for me, it's, it's all up to. <laughs> what's up there. Okay. I, I quite like being a disembodied voice, but I understand why <coughs> it's not optimum. I'm afraid that's the uh, lower server setting by the looks of it. Let's just have a look. Yeah. Okay. So this first group of work, Century, is a show that I'm opening this Friday in Berlin. So this is the first time I've, I've presented it. And it's a show that looks really closely at the work from the last century and then um, translates it into the work that I'm currently excited about doing. I think I work in software, which is very unusual for an artist, but I think to be self-critical, I've been too influenced by the past, I think, over the years, particularly in um, conceptual work and minimal work from the 60s and 70s. So for this show, I decided to fully in immerse myself within the artwork of the last century that I know so well and that I love so much, and to produce a new body of work from that. So this is the, the very first piece, which is called Yes, No. And we're going to look at that as software first. And I'm just going to give you some seconds to look at it and think about it. So we'll come back to this piece a little bit later. Uh, but for now, let's look at how it's being represented. So this is a piece of text which describes a system um, with different layers. And it says layers of original and appropriated instructions. So the first layer, stratum 1, make a, gr make a grid or find a grid, do one thing or do another thing inside each unit. So that's as, as base and general as you can go. So we go one more level of detail. Draw a uniform grid of 200 by 200 squares within a one, meter, one square meter. Open a telephone directory and read the numbers in order. For each square, starting in the upper left corner, fill with blue paint if the number is even, or fill with red paint if the number is odd. So this is an existing artwork. This is an appropriation. This is Francois Morellet, an early work of his, which I think is a very important piece using randomness in the work. So if we go at that same level, we can specify a different kind of system, which is draw a grid of 40 by 25 units, find a coin and define one side as A and the other side as B, for each square starting in the upper left corner, flip the coin. If side A, draw a line from the lower left to upper right. If side B, draw a line from the upper left to the lower right. This one's also an appropriation. And this is a text version of this piece of code, which we'll look at in detail a little bit more later. This is a piece of code for in, in, written in 1982 for the Commodore 64 computer. And this is a translation of that code to another environment, to the processing environment. So one thing that I'm interested in is the way each one of these instructions um, defines the same system, but does so in a different notation for a different platform. And here is, is, a, is a group of prints that's based on this system. Um, and what you see here is the original Commodore 64 output. Here is an emulator, or running on a Commodore 64 emulator. And these on the right are two interpretations that I've made of this system by modifying some of the instructions uh, to a little bit more detail. These are three different groupings. Uh, the next piece is called Network C. So let's have a look at that. So this piece is heavily derived from the work of the distill artists, in particular uh, Piet Modrian. And even more specifically, in a piece that he has hanging in, the metro, uh, the, in New York called Broadway Boogie Woogie. So at that time, Modrian was really inspired by Boogie Woogie, a style of music which was really radical and progressive at the time, and also by the life and energy of the Manhattan street patterns. And so this piece starts as a regular grid, a grid of points that are all um, perfectly aligned with each other. And then using a little bit of 
um, random distribution, those points are moved from the precise grid to a little bit further away, and then they're connected and reconnected. They're then ordered from the middle, and then the piece grows out and then grows back in, and there's three layers on top of one another. It's sort of the premise of the piece is that the, the network or the streets of Manhattan in the 1930s was the most sort of dynamic, energetic um, network imaginable for that artist. For myself, it's a very different kind of network, and I think you can easily read into the kinds of networks that are being referenced here in this piece. So from that piece of software, there's a few different prints derived from that. Often when I work, I work in software as, as a starting point, and then I move into other media, which we'll see a little bit more later. So that's one derivation. So the next step for the network piece, this one's called Network D, is to think more about the quality of music, um, particularly in the last century, that myself and many other people working in the, in the late 90s found a lot of inspiration from. So let's really quickly listen to a little bit of music. This is, this is Boogie Woogie. So when you think of Modrian's work, you think of rigid, rigid static, orthogonal grids. Um, he was even so pure about making grids that he refused to put um, lines on a diagonal because he felt that um, started to imply space on the canvas. But at the same time, he was really free. Um, and they were done entirely by eye. And this kind of music, I think, embodies the spirit of some of his later works. In contrast to that, this is the kind of work that a lot of us were listening to at the end of last century. So the idea was to take the original network piece. You know that kind of music. Um, and then to um, use that as the base and then do something else with it. And so of course the networks that I'm referring to here are computational networks. And in that case, we talk about packets. We talk about sending small bursts of data and then recompiling it on one side. We talk about different kinds of compression algorithms. And so what I've done here with, with this piece is to take one of the network pieces, and then to um, basically lose some information and compress it down, and this is the result. So it's really hard. These prints are about two meters long, so it's really hard to see on screen. So I made some details for you. And then this is another piece which is further fractured by one more, one more level, so twice as many levels. These are some details of that. But again, it's starting with a pure regular grid and then doing distortion from there. So moving from one point and then journeying to another, searching through a parameterized space for and discovering new forms along the way. So the last piece from the network show that I'll show you is this one, which is called Signal to Noise. And it clearly references information theory, Claude Shannon. But I think for me, the most important reference, again, comes from the history of 20th century art and specifically from collage. And later, video work, particularly um, Kurt Schwitter's in terms of collage, and then Nam June Paik in terms of sort of this visually assaulted video artwork. And so this piece takes a half hour of television, unedited, and then um, collages it back in this new, newly formed way. And other ideas behind this piece relate to communications technologies in the 20th century, of course, the foremost being television and then moving into computers. So this piece mar marries those two. And then also the transition from analog um, um, distribution to digital distribution. And I think for me it's also important with this piece that the, the television signals being captured are terrestrial signals. So they're, they're signals that are moving through us all the time, um, being captured directly from the air, and then being um, uh, newly formatted in this way, which for me sort of embodies the spirit of, of, of the kind of the essential nature of television rather than the images themselves. So this piece goes on for, as I said, about a half hour. But we won't do that now. OK, so that is the new work. Now what I want to do now is give you an overview of the work that I've been doing literally for the last decade and to talk about the ideas behind it, because most of it's very different from what I just showed. Um, this is an image of the very first thing that I programmed. This was back in 1998. And I started off programming things. I was exploring motion. I was exploring interaction um, in this really limited palette. And at the same time, 
uh, doing things that were really precise, where I was defining every, every last detail. And then that merged, merged into move, working with larger compositions. This is kinetic and moving and producing sound. But then from there, I took a really different departure point. And I started getting obsessed with artificial life and artificial intelligence, and reading deeply into that and taking robotics courses. And from there, I started working with emergence. And that really became the, the primary theme of my work for about a decade. These were the first pieces that I built using emergence. And this is the detail of one of those. Or not a detail, but one of those images. And then that moved into a slightly different um, kind of image. And these were all based on a, a system uh, invented by Valentino Breitenberg, who was a neuroanatomist. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that system in detail in a bit. So these pieces were all performative. So there were a series of points on the screen that I was able to move around. And, and these different software agents were moving in, di in direct response to the movement I was making. So what I liked about doing this was that I was, of course, writing a system and authoring a system and in control, but I wasn't in total control. Unexpected things happened. I made a small change, a macro change sort of resulted from that. Um, after working on that for a while, I started working with more complicated, well, actually, the systems were no more complicated, but, but the populations were more complex. So here we have 500,000 different agents in the environment, and so it moved away from being performative to more of a rendered environment and working more with texture and massing and less with, with line and flow. After a while, I started thinking that color was getting in the way of what was actually happening there, the underlying structure. So uh, this diptych was a result of that. And these are all printed works that derived out of the software. Here's a, actually a photo of the print, so you can see a little bit more of what the actual material is like, rather than just a digital representation of it. And then from there, um, after working with Breitenberg systems, I started inventing my own. And I started working with the most minimal, primitive geometry that I could imagine, circles and lines. And so all the work that I did after that for about six years were just using lines and circles as the starting point. And using these systems, which were so precisely minimal, they were almost um, they were clock-like, almost atomic in their nature. But then I was producing things through emergence that were uh, sort of unexpectedly organic out of these really precise mechanical systems. And so that developed into larger compositions, which developed into installations. Uh, this piece, you're able to move around, and it really created a space rather than just an image. And that moved into some, to some performance pieces. I have some software that is similar to this that I can show you. So that particular performance was for Steve Reich's Music for 18 Musicians, which is an extraordinary piece of, um, of, of music. And it's largely percussive and largely deals with phasing. And so when I had the commission to do a live visual performance for that music, um, I found, I, or basically I, I adopted this software that I was working with that was already using phasing, and then combined it with drawing. And so all the marks that you see here are marks that I've made with my hand, drawn marks, and then the different elements or the different agents emerge from those marks, and then, but then once they're deposited within the surface, they then follow their instructions. So it's a bit more um, choreographed than some of the other work, which is entirely emerging from the bottom up. So after a while of working with that, I started realizing that these systems were so simple, I could actually define it as a few simple instructions. And so here is the library that I built. Circle and line, and then here are the behaviors. Move in a straight line, constrain to surface, et cetera. The forms and the behaviors are grouped together in terms of elements, and then I write a process in text that then defines how those elements um, are visualized within the environment. And so from that, I developed a series of processes, which I call process four through process 18. And we're going to look at um, image examples of those uh, moving forward, starting with four. And um, this is a part of, after working with that for a number of years, I developed a project called the Process Compendium, which essentially revisited them all at the same time and put them all within the same uh, visual space. So that's four, this is five, this is six, seven. I'm going to stop counting and let you count in your heads. So these are all different sort of spaces, parameterized spaces, that emerge from working with those, those simple sets of instructions. And this one's process 18, which is the, the final one. I don't think there'll be more after this. Um, this is how they were exhibited. This is essentially a family tree. So the different processes that share elements are grouped together. Uh, this is a set of, um, set of prints, a set of diptychs that are based on process 18. So I'm going to show you that software. I 
Another thing about the software is that it's all very measured in its pacing. It's really meant to be ambient. It's not meant to be the focus or center of attention. And it's meant to run for days, weeks, and months at a time. Um, and it's really meant to be something to be lived with rather than something that um, you're watching now for like one minute, which is, which is what we're doing today. But it has a starting point, and it starts to build, and, and the drawing proceeds from there. But it really doesn't have an end point. It eventually reach some, reaches a density, and then it basically draws and erases itself over time, keeping this um, the same level of contrast throughout time. So it's a really large space of parameters to search within. Um, over a period of months, I tune them really finely, and then that becomes the final piece of software. And then other projects tend to emerge from these individual pieces of software as well. So moving forward. So I'm going to now go through some other kinds of work. This is a, and I'm going to talk about this one more in a, little, in a little bit when I talk about things in more detail. This is a commission for the New World Symphony, which is a building that Frank Gehry Partners built, or Gary Partners built, um, in Miami, Florida. And it opened in January 2010. And the New World Symphony is an orchestra. It's a teaching orchestra. And so the commission here was to marry the architecture with, with, a form, with sort of the structure of sound. And we did so by um, taking photographs of the building, taking photographs of the neighborhood, and then producing generative software with 365 different modes, um, each one running for an hour, going through a transition on the hour. And I'll talk about this one a little bit more in a minute. Uh, this is a project that's really different from all the other work that I'm, that I'm going to show you. Um, it was a large collaborative piece uh, with hundreds of people that was for the IBM Centennial. And it was this installation called Think, which was at Lincoln Center, which is the ma major performing arts space in New York. And I worked with a really small team of my former students with David Wicks, Razid Spell, Jonathan Cecil, and John Houck to develop the, what we call the data wall, which was essentially a display of visualizations about energy use and um, sort of data around, around the city of New York within this site in the center of the city. Here you can see a little bit more of the detail. Here you can see more of the, the texture of the wall. It was really a low pitch LED wall. Sometimes it had abstract images. Other times it resolved to, to text to tell these short stories around data. We had the whole building outfitted with sensors. So on the roof, we had cameras doing computer vision. We collaborated with some engineering teams within IBM Research for monitoring the traffic. We had a solar panel. We were monitoring the solar capacity of the roof. And we also had a weather station. We were mon monitoring the, the particulate in the air. And so through that real-time data, we were able to collate that with data from around the city and then tell these short stories around data. This is the story around air particles. At times, it's very much of a visualization. At times, it's more illustrative. These were lungs that pulsed in and out as the particles were moving inside. Um, this was a story around financial transactions. We had another story around traffic. Um, another project uh, that I spent uh, this spring and summer working on is also radically different. This is doing a stage environment for a band, um, United States band called Yesayer. And I worked really closely with the architecture studio Aranda Lash on this project. These are images, sort of found images on Instagram during the performances. And then these are a series of images that we took during rehearsal that really show the piece in a lot more detail. So essentially the idea here was to create a set of modules that then could be performed live within the stage. So let me show a video of this, and I'll talk over the video while it's playing. So I'm going to turn off my own voice and just talk over it. Um, it's a shame you can't hear the music, though, because this project is really about a, a tight marriage between the music and the images. And we made a, a full system which is dynamically performable. So the same way the band is, is performing live, um, the visuals are also performed live by two people who are touring with the band. And the basic idea of the piece was to, first of all, fit with the quality of their music. Their music has a little bit of a, a futuristic tone. Um, it's also really bright and, and vibrant. And so working with these, these light forms and these crystal forms we found to be really appropriate. Um, on one hand, their music has, it has sort of a, a mystical quality. On the other hand, it's also very technical. They use a lot of sampling. 
they do a lot of experimental sound design in their music as well, while still fitting within this format of a, of a pop R&B rock band. And uh, we started with the starting point for this piece was to work with these, these crystal forms, the idea being that um, crystals, of course, um, have this uh, sort of new world component or new agey component, um, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a negative way. But then they also have this really strong tie to electronics, the way that when you put a current through a crystal, it vibrates at a really precise frequency. And so from there, we really tried to build out the stage in a way that embodied the music and also um, changes a lot drastically over the course of the performance. It's choreographed to, to be different over the course of the full hour. Um, another thing about this project is the constraints. It has to pack down flat to tour with the band. And so that had a lot to do with the, the final forms as well. And Arandalash did a really amazing job in making these forms that are foldable. They, they break down flat. And then also, because they're made out of polypropylene, you can light them from the inside. So there's just a really lot of dynamic um, components you can do while the band's performing. All right, so next, we're going to move on. That was a really quick overview of the work. I want to talk about three pieces in detail and to talk instead of what they look like or what, to talk about the systems behind them and how they actually work. So we're going to start with process 18, and we're going to look at element 5 in a little bit more detail. So these are the, the components of element 5. Form 2, it's a line. Behavior 1, move in a straight line. Enter from the opposite edge after moving off the surface, orient towards the direction of an element that is touching, and deviate from the current direction. And so that's put together into this process. I'll give you a moment to read that. So from there, this is how this work was oftentimes exhibited. Um, you had the, the process displayed on one side, the element displayed on the other side, and then the text instructions on the left and right. And so if we look at this as software, I think that's when it really becomes revealed. So you can see that one side is the same as the other side. And where there's a lot of energy and action, for example, here, you can see that translated onto that side. One side is the instantaneous view of the element, and the other side is the aggregate of looking at the process, of looking how that element is, is made visual. And again, these pieces, they have a starting point, but really no end. They're ambient, they're slow, almost meditative in a way. But then at the same time, they embody this synthetic quality and also contrasting with an organic quality as well. So again, from there, an other series of other kinds of work emerge. So these are two prints from Process 18. Hopefully you can see that when you, when you take this system from software and, 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 and I move it into print, that there's a lot of uh, visual differentiation. And there's a detail so you can see that. That's essentially because of the resolution of the printed medium is different in two ways. One, you can render over a longer period of time and then also you have this really fine visual quality while screens are very coarse and rough. Um, printed images are, are really continuous and almost analog. Well, they are analog in the end, but of course they're made from digital files. And then this is another variation of that too, just an exploration, pretty simple, of taking that same data and moving it into a relief. So another system to talk about is the system that makes up the tissue pieces. And these are officially Breitenberg vehicles. Um, in the early 1980s, Valentino Breitenberg, again a neuroanatomist, wrote this really elegant book called Vehicles that a lot of roboticists are really... Um, we're excited about. Um, and essentially, it takes his knowledge of anatomy and combines it into these conceptual machines. And so the way to read these, this is something that senses. This is something that is an actuator or moves. And then this is the connection between the two. So you have these three different configurations, a straightforward connection, a cross, and then a little bit of both, which more conforms to nature. So of course, these vehicles do nothing on their own. But when you put them in an environment where there's something they're interested in or something they're able to, to sense, then these really simple bodies are, become behavior. So you can see with a straight through connection, it approaches and then moves toward whatever it's interested in. In this situation where they're crossed, it moves toward it, and when it gets close, it moves away, as one moves faster than the other because that sensor is closer than the other. So the first thing I did when looking at these Breitenberg vehicles was to make a software version of the system in the most uh, basic way possible, and basically just making a one-to-one -one diagram of what's happening. 
So in this system, the dots are what the vehicles are interested in. The vehicles are there on screen, and you can see how their, um, their wiring or their simulated software-based wiring translate into behavior. You can see some are really active, some are not, some approach, which, which Breitenberg actually talks about the vehicles being shy or aggressive. He really assigns these um, animistic traits to these inanimate objects. When we get more in the environment, that's when things begin to be more interesting. And you can start to see, oh, by the way, each color corresponds to a different kind of wiring, which, which you may have guessed. You can see them group together or aggregate over time. Um, what I started to, to realize as I was doing this was this was less interesting than actually looking at the paths that they took. So each one of these lines is the history of one of those vehicles. Um, I think it's 200 different time steps. And from there, uh, it becomes a, a record of their behavior rather than just an instantaneous position. And so what you can see is if I move these pieces together, how they react and respond. And then eventually they, they move into this, this area where they're always in motion, but the forms um, sort of cohere. And if I move one away, you can see how they react and respond and then develop a new piece from there or a new composition from there. So this is this idea of emergence where I have control over the system, I'm the author of it, but at the same time I'm able to push and pull them, but not directly choreograph them or control them. So a series of prints developed from that. This is work from 2001, so it's about 11 years old now. Um, and then this is an installation that actually just went up in, in winter 2012 in Chicago at the Art Institute. Um, this is the largest printed piece that I've done. You can get a sense of the scale there. And then this is a, another instantiation of that, a series of, of dresses that I collaborated on with my wife, Kate. So now we're back to the Gary Project. I'm going to talk about this one in more detail. Again, this is a concert hall. So the, the commission was to marry the, um, the architecture of the building and the forms of the architecture of the neighborhood with the structure of music. And here's a detail of the display wall so you can see it a little bit better. And this is basically what's driving it. It's four HD projectors that are stitched together on the surface. So I want to show you what the software looks like. Oh yeah, that's here. So the piece is based on time, and it's based on a metronome, which is based on the clock. So every second, a little bit of motion is put into the system. Every minute, a little bit more motion is put into the system. On the hour, an event occurs, and then it displays another system for that hour. So I'm going to go through some of the different compositions so you can see them. And again, everything that's black here, because it's projected, is the actual building surface itself. So these images make a lot of sense um, four and a half stories high on the side of the building in the park watching it. They don't make a lot of sense um, sort of with a black rectangle on, on the screen. But again, this, the location of this building is in the historical Art Deco neighborhood in Miami. And so a lot of the images come from the neighborhood, and then other images come from the building itself. Basically, we, we got the commission about two years before the building opened, maybe a year and a half, and we went to the site every few months and took photographs during the construction. And so part of the piece, too, is excavating the forms inside the building that have been lost through the construction process. And because it's a generative system, the piece basically um, is always different, and it's radically different over the, over the course of the year. So I'll show you what the transition looks like when it goes from one hour to the next. So the, the number of times it transitions is based on the hour. And so in order to realize this, we developed 12 different um, families of systems. Um, based on the collages that we had built uh, as preparatory work, and then um, developed a, a system for specifying the parameters in kind of a rapid way as a way to develop these 365 different compositions. And then before the opening, we spent a number of nights out on the lawn of the building testing them all and tweaking them and modifying them, removing some, adding some others that really worked in the space itself. And so these are some images from, from the development time from when we were, they're the raw source images from the neighborhood and from the building under construction. For example, a classic uh, Gary's uh, partner's form like that, which eventually got covered, um, is captured in the piece. So the system we took was to take an image, to take one piece of the image, and then to develop collages from that. So this is a really rough um, phone photo of my studio while we were working on it. We developed over 1,000 different compositions by hand, not by hand, but 
but using uh, Photoshop over the course of a year, um, non-computationally. Um, and then from there, we weeded it out and really found the compositions we were most excited about. We started to develop these contact sheets as a way of communicating with each other um, and selecting the ones we wanted to move forward with, the ones we wanted to cut. And then from there, uh, we developed this really simple XML-based system that allows us to um, take a piece of an image and define which system it is and what the values are in order to create all the different compositions. So it became really fast and, and, and in a way, a furious um, rush to develop all these 365 different compositions, but it was really um, uh, enabled with this really simple data system for modifying the parameters and then hooking directly this, these um, text documents directly into the software. And then after that, we developed a series of printed images um, in a way to um, further refine and to capture the essence of some of these pieces of software. So that's what we're looking at now. And then to give you a little bit of a window into, into the process of developing these prints later and also the software, um, for example, we'll take this image and we'll look at some possible variations. So in almost all the prints that we've been looking at tonight, um, there, there's varying degrees of randomness involved, either a minute amount to a lot of different options. Um, and for every print, I typically generate 100 to 300 different options and then modify the system based on what I find, and then make selections and adjustments based on what happens. So these are some of the potential options for that final print that we see here being the final piece. So what I want to do now is look at one system in a lot of detail. And so the system we're going to look at is this, this line of code. This is the yes, no. So flip a coin. If we get heads, do one thing. If we get tails, do another thing. And I'm going to go right to the source, but first we're going to look a little bit at the hardware that it runs on. So this is the Commodore 64 machine, and these came out around 1982. Um, actually, they did come out in 1982 because they just had their 30-year anniversary. And this is a really special piece of hardware. This is not the keyboard, but it's the whole computer kind of embedded in there. And the important thing about, one important thing about the Commodore 64 is that they also had these graphic forms inscribed on the keys. And so the two graphics we're interested in are that one, this one and this one. This one's 205 and this one's 206. And these are specified in terms of Petsky, which was, the, which was uh, developed for the Commodore PET, which is a graphic symbol system, which correlate to numbers inside, of the, inside the computer. Um, this is the 1982 Commodore 64 user manual. And this is a three-line version of our piece of code, which we've um, brought down to one line through some optimization. And then this is the page at the end of the user manual where we can actually correlate the different um, signs to the numbers. So this is 109 and that's 110. In our program, for some reason, like the user manual, we're using 205 and 206, which you see here, um, codes 192 to 223 are the same as codes 96 to 127. That still actually baffles us. Um, you may think it's a joke, but it's actually true that a group of 10 authors and myself have spent two years writing a book about this one line of code. Um, that's coming out this November from MIT Press. The idea being to unpack what this one line of code means in terms of looking at basic, um, looking at the rise of the personal computer, looking at generative art um, in the art world and also in the computational world, and other topics. But I want to show you now, I don't want to go on too much about that because I know it's not of interest to many of you in the audience, but I want to I look at this algorithm in a lot of detail as a way to expose what is fundamental about the system and uh, what is not. All right, so the first time I'm going to type it in. So the first thing we have is 10. And then after 10, we have print. So when we print, we're going to print to the screen. And we're going to print a character to the screen. And as mentioned, we're interested in characters 205 and characters 206. So this is halfway in between both of them, 205.5. And then we're going to add a little bit of randomness to that. Basically flip the coin. And then we're going to uh, put a semicolon in there, which has a different meaning for most languages today. Um, that basically allows the characters to draw one after another rather than having a line break. And then we put in a colon, which allows us to concatenate two lines of code into one line. And then we say go to 10, which just runs that same line of code over and over again. So compile this in your head. Imagine what it's going to do. 
Then we'll type in run, and we'll see the result. I think the thing that's interesting about the piece of code is that it really is the most minimal system. It's flipping a coin, drawing one thing or the other thing. But it has some visual properties that, that are interesting and sort of dock into our cultural understanding of form. This is clearly a maze-like form, which has a lot of interest in terms of uh, history of, of religion and labyrinths, uh, in terms of like early, early gaming culture, et cetera, et cetera. But let's look at what this code does um, if we make some modifications. So here are the modifications. I'm not going to type them out again. So 205 and 206 are these two lines of code which draw the left and right lines. What if we try two other lines of code? So here we're looking at um, a pipe and uh, a dash. So you can see it's the same system, but it's being visualized in a different way. So the, the fundamental question here, it's really obvious, is how does visualizing the system in a different way affect our perception of what the system is? All right, next. This is a little bit less clean, it's a little bit ugly, but this is how we have to write the code if we want to look at two characters that aren't adjacent. And so these are two characters that have a character space in between them. So we take the result of the random value, we add a 0.5 and then multiply by 3. And that allows us to straddle with one character in between. And so we, can do, we have to do that if we want to access these two characters, which also make a maze, an orthogonal maze, um, but somehow lacks the dynamic of, of the prior maze. This is the Maldrian maze, and the one that we're primarily concerned with is the Van Doesburg maze. All right, next. This one uses the poke command. So instead of drawing the maze, drawing the characters one after another and skipping lines, it actually is just writing into anywhere on the screen that it pleases. Um, it's directly accessing a random point on screen. So again, this shows how it's the nature of um, the linear progression of the piece that really is a, a part of its essential character, which is essentially a part of the Commodore 64 system. Um, here, we said 205.1, so we have a loaded coin, or like a loaded die. Um, and we're basically increasing the probability that the line is going to be left-leaning. So how does that change the system? How does um, sort of uh, ruining the perfect probability or the perfect pseudo-probability uh, modify how the system works. And then lastly, we're going to make it so instead of picking two adjacent characters or two characters straddled, we're picking any possible character um, inside the pet ski from 0 to 255. And what you see is that some of the keys, of, some of the pet ski characters affect color, some of them clear the screen, and this is the result. Um, as, you know, over the summer my aesthetics have changed a lot, this is actually more to my taste now than the pure regular grid that I, I kind of started out with. But I think it's all interesting that it's a part of the same, the same system of coin flipping and then modifying these parameters. I hope you find this fascinating and we're not totally way off base. But we're going to move on from there to something a little bit more detail. So this is what it looks like when it's actually running on the Commodore 64, um, which of course is an analog signal. And this is what it looks like in a little bit more detail, which is a form that I'm really fascinated with, having been a, a very digital person for the last decade or so, 15 years or so. Um, you can actually see the artifacts of the CRT. Um, and it's a really different quality than the emulated version, which is you know, computationally the same. So we get into this idea of platform studies, or the idea of how does the hardware modify the system itself. All right. So from there, we're winding down. Um, we're going to look at form and code and try and bring this back around to some architecture examples. Um, in 2010, myself, Chandler McWilliams, and Lust produced this book called Form and Code in Design, Art, and Architecture. The idea was to make a, a primer or an overview for undergraduate students or professionals who are interested in what code is doing within these fields. And this book aspired to answer, oh, before I do that, it's grouped into trying to develop an understanding of what code is and a short history of, of how form and computers have been intertwined. And then it goes through these five different topics, repetition, transformation, parameterization, visualization, and simulation. So we found over time through our teaching that these are topics that the undergraduate students can really latch onto and understand. And it's a good way to introduce a lot of the potential for software within the visual arts. And so these are the three questions the book aspired to answer. How has software affected the visual arts? What is the potential for, for software within the visual arts? And then I think really the more personal important question is as a designer or artist, why would I want or need to write software? 
I mean, my premise is that everyone in their education should have a little bit of experience writing code. Um, almost all work, architecture, design, art, is, is using computers as tools now. And sometimes that moves a little bit further into using software as a medium itself rather than just a tool. And I think it's really important to understand what the machine can do inherently rather than what, it, what these prepackaged pieces of software abstract for you. But I think it's important to learn a little bit deeper of what's going on so you can think around it, so you can imagine something beyond what software of the moment is doing. We all know that software is changing. Within the course of your education here, you'll probably start learning something and end up using something else. Um, over the last decade, kind of the dominant tools being used within architecture have been a really quickly moving target. So the premise is that it's important to understand more fundamentally the potential of software and what software is doing, rather than just learning it at the tool level. So I'm going to show you a series of examples that many of them I think you will already know. Um, some of you will know more about them than I do, not being a member of the architecture community. But I really wanted to show how these ideas that I've been talking about, and I really want to emphasize more importantly the ideas rather than just the technical aspect of coding, um, are translating into your field. Oh, sorry. I need to also mention who they, who they are. This one's Morphosis. This is 2008, the Fair Tower. Um, some of you probably saw this one. This was a Serpentine Pavilion in 2002 by Toyo Ito and Arup. And again, this one uses, used, I don't think used any code, but it uses the idea of recursion, um, which, is an, which is an idea that's really um, well suited to exploration through writing code. Here we have um, Shop Architects, the Rector Street Bridge from 2002. This was in response to 9-11 in, in developing a really quick pedestrian walkway using parameterization to um, get across this area of the town. Here we have uh, Gramazio and Kohler. Um, and this is work where they wrote a genetic algorithm to kind of balance how quickly something can be built with um, trying to get a level of detail um, and sort of physical resolution to it. And these structures were all meant to be built by um, Axis robot arms. Um, here we have um, Kukugia, uh, Roland Snooks' group. Um, swarm urbanism, where you were using agents to look at different um, urban planning scenarios. Here we have Moss Architects. Um, this was a piece done for a Buckminster Fuller exhibition. They've been doing a lot of really interesting simulation-based work lately, where they've been hiring programmers and working really closely with them to simulate things before they build them. And each, this is color-coded based on the, the length of the segments, and this was meant to be kind of a, a Gaudi-like hanging piece that they later realized. Um, here we have RNC. Uh, here we have the very many, Mark Forns. This is a piece um, developing ideas of uh, parameterization and, and modular construction, where this whole thing was, was laser cut, put in a suitcase, um, traveled to um, The Hague, and then was assembled over a short period of time using zip ties. This is um, my collaborators over the summer on the ACER project, Aranda Lash, um, developing this kind of work by finding forms within a crystalline structure. Um, this is uh, clearly not the best, the best example from Zaha Hadid's studio, but it is a example of using fabrication techniques um, for working with things at the scale of furniture. Um, this is from Greg Lynn's studio. Um, this is ongoing, um, but it's a parameterized, um, complete set of tableware. Um, and now I'm going to show you the work from a few artists who are working sort of within the scale of architecture. Um, this is Rafael Lozano Hemmer. This was realized in, in Japan, and this, these lights are being controlled um, through um, sending signals through text messages. This is Jennifer Steinkamp, who's a colleague of mine at UCLA. She's really mastered the art of projection into architectural space. And this is a kinetic piece where each of these vines is moving around at an erratic rate. Now, this is Pablo Valbuena. It's an early example of, of mapping into a space. This is in Madrid, um, outside the Media Lab Prado. And then this is from local-based United Visual Artists. This was at the V&A a number of years ago. They've gone on to sort of push this much further in recent years. But when the book was written, this was sort of the example. Um, also introducing ideas of interactivity into these light spaces as well. And then the very last thing I want to do, I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to be really brief, is to talk about processing um, as a way of the form and code book was really written to get people excited about this work. If, if you like these examples, um, then it's likely that you should try to learn how to program to kind of go deeper in that, in that direction. And processing is really the way that we've been trying to develop an educational system for teaching programming within the visual arts. And these are scans from my notebook from around 2000 
The idea that a computer is not an object, it's not a beige box, but instead it's a system and a process. Really trying to teach people how to think in terms of systems rather than in terms of objects, in terms of parameterization, in terms of a specific form was a key idea of the project. And then these are early um, specifications for the software, again, from 2000. Um, and the idea was to take a f traditional foundation studies with you know, the Bauhaus-based foundation studies, thinking about color and form and space, and how to do that computationally, um, how to approach that through writing software. And so one thing about processing that, that I think has made it useful across different fields is its flexibility. So this is just a list of um, a lot of the different areas in which it, it can move into. And for the people in the room who, who are programmers, this is a family tree. Um, just like human languages, programming languages have trees as well. They, they, they're sort of derived from other languages and other languages spawn from them. So processing, situ it's situated here, heavily influenced by PostScript, designed by numbers, C, and Java. And then it's also spawned out Android processing, processing JS, which is a JavaScript version, then also wiring, which then spawned the Arduino project. So, I think the most important thing about processing, or one of the most important things, is it's free and it's available to download online. Um, online, we have a number of tutorials to get people started. Um, Jose has actually been making some really amazing video tutorials, which I recommend checking out. Um, we also have the full reference online, and we've spent a lot of time trying to make the reference understandable to people who don't have a prior background in programming. So, simple, plain language, and then putting the examples at the forefront. Um, one thing that we've worked a lot at is developing a community around the project to develop different libraries. And libraries are how the project extends beyond sort of the core of what it does, which is drawing and animation and interaction, to move into domains like sound, domains like computer vision. So we have over 100 different libraries that have been con contributed from the community that really enable it to move in different directions. And then lastly, the exhibition, which is curated locally by Philip Vizhnik of Creative Applications locally here, I mean, in London, and uh, which highlights different work every month. What I want to do really quick, I've, how many people in the room have used processing? So some not, so I just want to show it really quick. Um, I intentionally kind of did this cumbersome activity of moving back and forth between processing the whole time just because I wanted you to see the environment that all the work that I was showing was made in. Um, but essentially, you write programs like this. Um, I'll draw a line from 2020 to 8080. Because you're architects, you understand coordinate systems quite well, I think, through, through the CAD software that you use, um, and even just through, through life experience and primary school. But essentially, this is our hello world version of processing. Line 2020, 8080 draws a line from there to there. To get interaction, we need to add a little bit of structure. So we'll add a void setup and a void draw. And I'm going to set the size to be um, 800 by 800. And then we're going to have this line draw from wherever the cursor is, mouse x, mouse y, to width divided by 2, height divided by 2, and then run the program. Then you'll see here that now that line's drawing from the center of the screen to wherever my, my finger is. And then it proceeds from there. So the thing that differenti differentiates processing from a lot of programming systems that came before it are that within a workshop setting, you can have people writing code to do visual things within a very short period of time. Um, the traditional way programming is taught within a computer science program, you get to visual things maybe in the third semester. And it's just, it's, you learn the exact same things you would learn, not exact same things, but the same general concepts you would learn within a computer science program in learning programming, but you do it through making visual images, which is appropriate for the visual design culture that we're all a part of. So that's all that I'll say about that. Um, also, to kind of further the growth of the project, we've been working hard to have a sort of array of books for different uses put out. I just want to talk about two of them quickly. Um, this is the first book that Ben and I wrote in 2007. And in writing this book, we attempted to do something new in how programming is taught in a textbook. We have a series of really short, minimal examples where the images that the code produces are in line directly with the code. If it's code that produces animation, we have multiple images to show how it changes over time. And then the, we also strive to have the book be about one-third code, one-third images, and one-third prose. So trying to marry that all together. This is the table of contents for the second book we wrote, which is a short, really short paperback book meant for hobbyists and for workshops. And this is maybe one of the most boring slides that I'm, gonna, that I'm showing tonight, but for me it's one of the most important and one that I'm most proud of. And it basically represents about eight years of teaching in the classroom. 
Um, as I've been teaching programming at UCLA to 19-year-old um, undergraduate students and to first-year graduate students, um, over time, kind of counterintuitively, I've realized that the, the, the right order to introduce it is counterintuitive to what, I, what you thought it might be um, coming from more traditional programming classes. So we start off talking about drawing, talking about parameterization, working with interaction, and then loading in fonts and images and, and vector graphics, and then working on motion. And from there, we get into what's typically taught at the beginning of a computer science course, learning programming. We talk about functions and modularity. We talk about modularity even more with object-oriented programming, and then, and then um, for introducing the, the, the material. So these are a list of things that I think that Last year was the 10th anniversary of processing, and so at that 10th anniversary, we did a little bit of looking back. Um, these are the th we did a lot of things wrong, of course, over the last decade. These are some things that I think we did right. So in a way, this slide is meant to encourage um, other kinds of systems to be built, and basically this is what we've learned over 10 years of how to build a system that's successful within the visual arts and within an education system. So basically, it needs to be built for teaching, but then to bridge to other languages, meaning that the language that you use can't be entirely obscure. It can't be something invented or fabricated for a specific domain because people have to learn the basics in that language and then be able to make a bridge to other different languages. So processing has a really nice bridge to C and C++ to ActionScript and to JavaScript. So that is a part in the original language design. Um, providing educational infrastructure, so basically providing materials to allow other teachers to teach with it. Um, it's important that we develop this while we were teaching rather than designing it and then just moving with it. So it really changed a lot through the interaction with, with the students. Um, that it's really easy to publish things so other people can see it, so people can share, and to build networks for sharing. And that um, it's something that's not um, contained within itself. It's something that's built into the structure that you can add on to it and expand it. All right, last thing. Another really important thing to say about processing is it's not the only kid on the block. There's a lot of other programming environments in the larger community that's being developed and formed. So I think you know the architecture tools better than I do, the, the Rhinos, the Grasshoppers, the scripting in Maya, so I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about more of the tools that are in the creative, creative coding community. It's a term that I really dislike very much, um, creative coding, but it's kind of the one that sticks for now and is functional. So within C++, we have open frameworks and Cinder. Within JavaScript, which is appropriate for working in the browser, um, using Canvas and WebGL, we have 3.js and Paper.js, and of course also Processing.js. Uh, for doing visual programming, so if you, if you don't prefer the text or, or, you know, programming like this in a text editor, as if you're writing a term paper, um, you can use visual programming languages that allow you to connect nodes and nodes together through um, patches. So that includes MaxMSP Jitter and V4, or VVVV. And then there's also, of course, the really specific domain languages like Scratch, which is developed for children. It's a kind of a Lego block-like approach to programming where you can't have syntax errors because you can only fit one coding um, sort of syntax structure with another one that fits together through the blocks. And then context-free, which is a really wonderful system for exploring recursion specifically. And then there's an extended list on the processing wiki to look at, I think there's probably about 50 different projects there that are visual arts-related co coding projects. And then, of course, if you're excited to learn about new and upcoming um, projects, Creative Applications is a really good source, and then also the Creators Project. And then that's the end. Um, thank you very, very much. Yes, 
Um, so the, the, I think, could everybody hear the question or do I need to repeat them? Repeat them, okay. So it's a question about live coding and it's, it's specific, um, how it's a specifically applicable to architecture and also if it's being integrated within processing. Um, the unfortunate answer is that we're way overextended in what we're trying to do with processing. Um, and it's also the truth that we do believe that that is something that is, is a better way to, to work in a live coding way where you can make changes and see the updates simultaneously. Um, when we, we, processing has always been on an edge between scripting, where live coding is the norm, and compiled, fast, optimized programming, where speed is sort of the, the goal. And so we've always straddled the two. So we've been a, a language which is similar to scripting and how you can form things, but it approximates the speed of a compiled language. And so I think the, the live coding is, is where it's really appropriate is if you're doing testing and prototyping and sketching, which has always been essential to processing. We call processing programs sketches, and we call the place where they're contained the sketchbook. And this idea of sketching with code is something that's always been essential to the project. So what we've done for the 2.0 processing release is we've made a, a new way of integrating into the project called modes, or I can actually show it here really quick. So you can see the different modes we have now are, um, are Java, Android, and JavaScript. And soon, uh, right now, people can add other modes. So there's going to be a mode which is a debugger. Um, we hope to get Python in there um, for the 3.0 release. And, but the thing about modes is anybody can make them. And so Florian Yenit has been working on developing a, a live programming tool that could be a mode. So basically, Ben and I have always been bottlenecks with processing, and the way we've always done it is to try and build a modular structure about other people to contribute. So we'd love to see live coding happen, but we don't have the capacity to, to do it right now. But it definitely, it is, it is a future, and a really strong, bright future for how programming interrelates with the arts. Actually, I'm having trouble hearing. Can you speak up? Uh, so the question is about the transition from the more organic work to the more rigid grid-based work. Um, it was really a transition over a period of years. Um, and I, I, I wanted to show those first things that I programmed to show that in a way that's where I started um, and then moved in this other area. But um, it really started with the chronograph project at working with photographs as the basic element, um, moving away from the more um, organic, natural, naturally derived emergent systems. And, it, it really has just been a natural progression over a period of years of, of following a, a different interest. I don't really have a, a, a reason other than it's just where my nose has taken me. I, I mean, I think that this work, um, as, I, as I tried to allude to at the beginning, the work for this show, Century, is work that I felt like I just, I felt like I've been too influenced by art history, and I really want to do this body of work that's directly focused on it so I can do something radically different next. And so I think if we would talk in a year, I think you'll find things in a, in a very different place than two. But at the moment, I'm really excited about um, working with more regular systems and making small distortions to them in order to explore something else. Yes. No, no, I think, I think that's true. I mean, one thing that I've always tried to do in the work, which is, which is found to be hard, is that to try and focus equally on the process and the result of the process. 
And so in the, the earlier work, which is more organic, the reason that work feels organic is because it uses emergence. This work doesn't, doesn't use emergence. Um, is to, I've always shown the description on the wall with the work. So in, in the process-based work, I've shown the text on the wall because I want people looking at the work to understand what the underlying system is. And so for this new work, um, in order, to, in order to, what I've done is to make systems that are so simple and to, permute, and to permute the systems over time that the system is just apparent, um, in my opinion, um, so that the text doesn't need, it doesn't need to be there. That instead I've, made, I've pared the system down to such a minimal system that I can just work with that rather than needing to explain it through supplemental text. So that, that's why it's kind of moved into the place where it is now. There's still the idea is to put an equal focus on the system and the process with the final result. Yes? Um, well, actually, one thing I'm doing right, not now, but in, in this time, is I'm doing a project which is called Century. And what that piece is, is to um, take 100 pieces of, of art that are system-based artworks from the 20th century and to encode them, re-encode them in code. And the, the plan is to do 100. Right now, I have 10 done. Um, but I chose not to show that today. So I am actually doing that right now. And the idea is not to emulate the work, but it's to basically make a statement that a lot of the work from the 20th century is process and system based to the point where it is primarily algorithmic work, but of course was not done in an algorithmic medium, and to try and re-explore that and to reinterpret those pieces through code. So I, I like that idea. Yes? Yeah, the question is about um, sort of raw, chaotic, physical expression as opposed to system-based work. Um, and I think when I talk about being influenced by a lot of art of the 20th century, I'm talking mostly about the, the logical, systemic-based artists who, who work more traditionally through drawing, through collage, and um, through sculpture even, and through performance. So it's, for me, the, the kind of work that is more about emotion and expression is work that I adore, but not work that I would ever imagine to produce. It's just not who I am. But so I'm interested in. Um, I don't know. That's the answer to that. Yeah. I mean, there, the, for for every stereotypical um, Rothko or Pollock, there's there's a Saul Lewitt and a Robert Morris or something like that. So I think there, there's a lot of artists who who do work in a really logical, rule-based systems as well, and that's more where I feed from. Yes? When you uh, make a part of it, it seems quite uh, discreet. Is it simplistic? I'm sorry, say that again? In your, in your, in your, in your current work, yeah. there's going to be um, the rules are simplistic, but they're simple. Um, so you make uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bits of images from that and you whittle it down. I wondered, um, as a method, do you use the more complex intellectual um, process to whittle those down to the final images? Yeah, um, basically I work, I work in trees um, where I start and then I branch that into a few different things and then I take the one of those that looks the most promising and branch that out and then I might go back to one of these others and branch that out. So my hard drive is just full of hundreds of different programs and, it's, it's, and oftentimes two months later I'll go back and look at it and, and branch off somewhere else from there. So when I, 
when I make the variations, it's, it, is, it can be an analytical process, but in the end, it's always intuition that drives the next step of things. And it's oftentimes, it's just a response to my eye uh, as to where things go over time. Yes? Yes? Are these, do you think this is like the, uh, is visual, um, is it visual emergence that um, you can see but the computer itself can't see? Or do you think there's a way you can get the computer to notice the emergence of the computer itself? And also you spoke about the importance of tuning parameters mm -hmm. in getting to a point. So how important is that uh, in your work? Do you think that's essential, understanding the effect of parameters on, on the um, end product? Yeah, I think there's, I don't know, I'll, I'll just say off the top of my head, there's three different parts of building a system. Maybe one is having the, the inkling or the notion of what it might be. The second part is building up the rule set from there. And then the third part is doing the tuning. And they all feed back on each other. And so for me, the, the tuning stage oftentimes happens over weeks of time. Um, and it happens through kind of in a, in a more traditional arts practice, setting something aside and coming back to it later and, and really looking at it over a long period of time. Um, rather than um, sort of trusting the judgment of, of the moment. And the tuning for me is a very essential part of the process. And that is a really an area where a high amount of subjectivity comes into it and sort of finding what I think is the most interesting space within this really large set of parameters that I've developed. Your first question was more complicated to answer, and I can't remember what it was. Yeah, I think because all the works that I, that I showed here tonight are, they make a point of having the system being as minimal as possible. I haven't worked with that feedback loop. Um, but of course, I've done a lot of reading and, and worked with graduate students who've been working with um, intelligence-based systems and also genetic algorithm-based systems where the system is aware of, of what's happening and then permutes itself in that way. Um, I've always, maybe in a slightly stuffy way, wanted to maintain control um, and so I've never allowed that extra step to happen. But it's been something I've always been interested in doing, but I've been more interested in doing other things. But I think that um, genetic algorithms, or GAs in particular, are a really fruitful area. Um, when we were writing the form and code book, we had a really easy time finding you know, myriad examples for the beginning of the book and talking about repetition and parameterization, um, visualization. But by the time we got to simulation, which is where genetic algorithms and intelligence happen, we found a really hard time to find examples from within the design community. And so I think that's, a, that's an area that's like so open for exploration. And I know that some academic institutions have been exploring that for a while, but I still think it's, it's full of potential. Um, most of the examples we ended up finding were from NASA or from research labs. And I really wanted to find examples within architecture, art, and design to, to add to the book. Sure. There was one over here. Yes? Do you see the world since you've done this so much? Do uh, you start to see it like a, the matrix start to decode yes. uh, everything? And, and on your daily life, do you see things that expi inspire you to go back and write quick notes that, uh, like from nature or from, from a building that uh, you see and you decode? And yeah, I think, I think with everything you study, it really filters your visual, per I mean, obviously there's so much going on in this room now and I'm filtering directly on you right now. And when you study something in a lot of detail and depth, you selectively filter the world. My wife's a fashion designer. And so she can tell me the person that she met yesterday, precisely every detail that they were wearing. And I don't know any of that. Um, typography was my first love and, um, when I was younger studying design. And so I would notice every typographic detail when I was walking around the city. And it just, it's, it's, it's amazing like how you can, just tune in on something like that. So in working with this kind of work, I've tuned in in that way as well. Um, I actually kind of, I find the most inspiration from experiencing other people's works, listening to music, um, watching films, and looking at paintings and drawings in museums, or I think the, th and 
Those are kind of the three major areas that I, like for example, if I'm listening to music in a hall, um, I always get distracted thinking about my own ideas rather than focusing on what's happening. So those are really the areas of, of strong influence for me. Do you translate it into scripts? No, I never, I never translate things into scripts directly except for this Century project that, that I was briefly mentioning. Um, it's more triggers or is a catalyst for something else. Yes? Uh, well, as far as I saw in your words, you use the thought that the way of process can be something which requires uh, artistic or could be a piece of art, which is used to like the result. So I was wondering, uh, and you referenced just now that you get inspiration from music and some pieces of art which you like. So I was wondering, what is art for you? Is it more a result or a process of the made? For me, it's a. Um, way of thinking, first and foremost. It's kind of a way of, um, a way of understanding the world or what's happening and a way of um, pushing out that representation back. But, but what is it more? What, what do you adore about it more? The process, how it's made, or is it oh, the final result that you get? The final result, I would say. That's a terse answer, <laughs> but, but it's the most accurate answer. <laughs> Well, I think for my own work, for my own work, a lot of the, I think, a lot of the enjoyment is in, is in the process. But for other people's work, it's really it, having the raw sensory experience of, of, of taking in that work. That's a new question. So I don't have a prepared answer. Okay, thank you.